Today on Uncommon Knowledge, an ounce or two of prevention. Funding for this program is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Our show today, The Doctrine of Preventive Force. In 2002, the Bush administration published a national security strategy, arguing that in the 21st century, the United States must defend itself not only when attacked, but by preventing certain threats, such as terrorist threats and weapons of mass destruction, from arising in the first place. Is the doctrine of preventive force, striking before we're struck, just? Is it effective? And what can the biggest example of the doctrine in action, the war in Iraq, tell us about the future of preventive force? Joining us today, three guests. Victor Davis Hansen is a fellow at the Hoover Institution. Stephen Stedman is a professor of political science at Stanford University. And Anne-Marie Slaughter is dean of the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. Analyst Gary Schmidt, quote, well before Bush became president. Prevention was a necessary policy option, and it will remain one long after he leaves the White House for a very simple reason. The world is what it is. Prevention, a necessary policy option. Steve? No. No. Henry? No. Victor? Yes, it's as old as the Greeks and the Romans. There was third Carth Carthaginian war, but there wasn't a fourth. All right, thank you very much. We'll discuss the doctrine of prevention in practice, but first I'd like to talk about it for a moment or two in sweet theory. 2002 National Security Strategy says that we have to make an effort not only to respond when attacked, but to prevent threats. Item number one, what's the difference between prevention and preemption? Who'd like to do some defining for us? Steve? Well, First of all, the, w the way that you've used prevention so far, it doesn't, right. it doesn't imply force. I mean, we, we do a lot of preventive things right. all the time. Diplomacy is about prevention. But if you're talking about the preventive use of force versus the preemptive use of force, I am. generally what we talk about is preemptive use of force is against a threat that is, that is imminent. Right. Um, and you use force to interrupt a threat that basically is in motion. Um, preventive force is against threats that are latent, not imminent. Everybody agrees with that? We're fine with the word yes. definition here? All right. Now, one of the traditional requirements for a just war is that any assault uh, force that is intended to forestall must indeed be imminent. So a preemptive war can very easily be a just war, falls covered under just theory. How could a preventive war ever be just? Victor? Because there could be conditions, social, economic, political, that are coming to a fore that within a brief span are going to make the security of your country um, in, brought, come, brought into question. In other words, let me give you an example. If you know that uh, a government is A, undemocratic, B, a rogue nation or lunatic, and C, about to come into nuclear weapons, but has not stated any um, direct threat against your country, then that might qu qualify for a preventive act of force to forestall the acquisition of nuclear weapons by a North Korea, for example. Moral theologian Michael Novak, quote, what does imminent mean when the attacking force is not launched through the mass mobilization of entire armies near a national border, but by a single clandestine attacker? What did the attack, when did the attack of September 11th become imminent? Meaning, what? in the in the circumstances the United States finds itself facing now, what, what this notion of, of imminence is, is no longer useful, as, or needs to be redefined, right, or not? The reason you now need to talk about preventive 
war rather than pre than preemptive war is because we are facing the kinds of threats where you're not going to be able to know uh, when the threat is imminent. Preemptive war, the classic example is the Israeli war in 1967. The armies are massing on the border. Right. You know they're about to strike and you strike first. That's preemptive war. That's the threat is imminent. Now That's the old fashioned nobody has any trouble nobody with that. Nobody has any trouble with that. That's been part of international law for forever. Gotcha. Uh, now the question is precisely that take what happened 9-11 or take you think that some country is about to get nuclear weapons and they are funding terrorists uh, and they are, are so imagine the Taliban was about to go nuclear right well at that point you know that if you wait till the threat is imminent it's too late right. by then you're not going to they if they, they've got a nuclear weapon you're not going to wait around wondering when they're going to use it so you have to strike beforehand you have to strike Anne Marie just gave a very impressive rationale for preventive force. So why did she say it wasn't necessary at the top of the show? On the opening question, when I said, is preventive uh, war a necessary option, you both said no. So what you're suggesting is that it can be a useful option, but it is not always necessary. What, why did you say you just you just made such a lovely argument for the use of prevention? Can, can, I, can I give my answer on that? Go ahead. Is that, give um, you may be thinking, Anne-Marie. My feeling is that the threats that we face today, um, I could envision circumstances under which preventive force should be used. Right. Um, my belief is that the proper uh, institution and proper authority for the preventive use of force should be collectively done and it should be the United Nations Security Council. Now th that would mean a revolution in how the Security Council does its business because it's traditionally a reactive body. It reacts to threats. In the future, given the threats that we face, it is going to have to be proactive. Um, so the reason so given, the, no. given, the, given the scenario that, that Anne-Marie described, uh, a state that felt threatened should go to the Security Council and lay out why this particular latent threat is so dangerous that it is a threat to international peace and security and therefore needs a collective response. Right. So you're, the reason you answered no to the opening question was you don't want the United States engaging in preventive force on its own. Right. Okay, and is that your answer as well? No, my answer was, it, the, the quote was that it's always been right. an option and always will be. I think we really are facing a new class of threats. I mean, if you, the, probably the best example of preventive war uh, before 9-11, mm -hmm. or a powerful example, is Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. So Japan attacks us because they know, they think, sooner or later, we're going, they're going to be at war with us, and they want to strike first to weaken us. Now, that strikes me as not something you want to encourage, and I think before, before now, it was not a good idea to allow preventive war, to allow for the possibility of preventive war, because what you were effectively doing was licensing states to attack other states. Now we face a world in which individuals can can create the kind of damage that only states could create before. And in that kind of a world, you can't wait for an imminent attack because they're not going to use more Let's armies. take a couple of case Can studies. I just reply real quickly? Yeah, of course. Absent from this argument is any singular appreciation of democracy and constitutional government. Your example about Japan is interesting because Japan was a military dictatorship. Mm -hmm. The United States was a constitutional government. And the same thing applies to the UN. Imagine we're going to go to the UN and ask the Security Council, of which Communist China has a veto power, which Communist China itself may well preempt democratic Taiwan, at least it's threatened to. And it also has North Korea on a leash, which is threatening the security of the, of the uh, whole Asian region. So the problem we, I, we have with all this, it sounds fine in theory, but when you look at the abstract way the world works there's democracies act a particular way and either collective autoco the, the, autocracies or autocracies per thought. se well no i'll give you case, a next case studies in the use of preventive force case study number one the smallest one 1981 israel launches an air attack against iraq destroying the reactor at osiric the Israelis acted to prevent Iraq from developing the capacity to produce enriched plutonium, which it might then have used in developing nuclear weapons. Was the attack on, on the Osiric reactor justified? Justified, and was it wise, Anne-Marie? It was not legal 
under the uh, of the law at the time. Uh, was it justified? I think it was justified. Right. I'm not certain. There's a real debate about whether it was effective because when we invaded in 1991, we found that the Iraqis had a flourishing nuclear program, and there's some evidence that they redoubled their efforts afterwards. On the other hand, it almost certainly bought time. That we don't know. It's a counterfactual. But if they hadn't struck uh, in 1981, maybe the Iraqis would have had a nuclear weapon by 1985 when they were fighting the war uh, against Iran. So it did buy time. Uh, and I think from the point of view of Israel, we're very worried uh, that here was a country sworn to the destruction of Israel to prevent it from getting that capacity. As a, as a political matter, I think it was justified. Steve? I would, I would largely concur with that. I mean, in terms of the legality of it, uh, it, was, it was not legal. And our ambassador, Jeannie Kirkpatrick, actually said so at the United Nations. Right. Um, it was important the question is, it, can, can Israel something is the actor here. So the notion of going to the UN, which had passed resolution after resolution after resolution against well, no, the it, existence it, of Israel, this is, is my not point. an option. Well, this is, but the, it's part of a larger point, which is, okay. Um, states are only going to use a collective security mechanism if they have confidence in the performance of that mechanism. And if they have no confidence whatsoever, then they are not going to use so it. So given the reality of the U UN as it existed in 1981, Israel did right. I would say that it was justified in what it did. Victor? Well, nothing's changed since 1980, 1981. 81. Since 1981, we've seen Sabrinka, we've seen Rwanda, we've seen Belfour. And all we know about the UN is that it's never preempted or prevented any war. And this well, that's not true, because there have been plenty of crises in the world where people could say, aha, I see a threat, and we need something to happen. Now, they, they, don't, take, they, don't, take a they don't take a decision to use force, but they use preventive diplomacy, they use mediation, they use a whole lot of different tools mm -hmm. short of war. Give me one major case where the lives of millions of people were at risk where the United Nations intervened to prevent genocide or a, a major war break. Well, I mean, the, the one time where they, where they did use troops for a preventive deployment was Macedonia. Which could have uh, been. Macedonia, a quarter million people died in the Balkans and the UN didn't do anything. The UN, 7,000 no, no, Dutch No, but you, you just asked me when have they used force in a preventive manner, and I'm giving you an example. No, what and stopped so then you're, And then you're saying, but they didn't use it over here. It doesn't, no, what it stopped, doesn't what stopped the Balkan denigrate crisis the fact was that they the did US, it in Macedonia. No, what stopped the Balkan crisis. Well, right. it surely wasn't it was Macedonia. Macedonia. No, we everybody was predicting that Macedonia if you look at the, the next domino in the Balkans, and it never and fell. And it never was. What stopped the Balkans crisis was the United States Air Force. There had been a quarter million people killed until the United States intervened, and I will say intervened unilaterally and without the uh, sanction of the U.S. Senate. And as I said earlier, Bill Clinton, I think, was quite right in doing that, and people who are very angry about Iraq and question its legality were quite silent about the lack of a U.N. resolution or a congressional big, resolution. Which brings us to the big case. Victor brings us to the big case study, the war in Iraq. Anne-Marie, let me quote you to yourself. I conclude that the invasion of Iraq was both illegal and illegitimate. The coalition's decision to use force without a second Security Council resolution cannot stand as a precedent, but rather as a mistake, close quote. Okay, explain yourself. The first thing I said was it was illegal. I do think it was illegal, uh, but it was potentially legitimate. If we had found weapons of mass destruction, uh, if we had been greeted with open arms by the Iraqis, if we'd gone back to the UN, I was saying even though we didn't have the, we did not have authorization, I thought okay. it was potentially legitimate. Ob obvious question. If we went in believing that there were weapons of mass destruction there and then discovered that our intelligence, the best intelligence available and it was, sh the impression seems to have been shared by other intelligence agencies, was simply mistaken, well, that makes it tough, it seems to me, when, when the basis for why we were going in and why we were asking the UN to mm -hmm. authorize what we were doing was we were saying there are weapons of mass destruction. It is not an imminent threat, but right. if we don't act now, we're going to be in big trouble. And other countries said, I think in retrospect with some justification, well, are you sure of your intelligence? And why don't we send the inspectors back in? And why don't we adopt a much more rigorous regime? And for, that, for us then to go in, and discovered that there really wasn't anything, it, it essentially, it, it certainly hurt our credibility, but it, it, 
it meant why didn't we wait? Why couldn't we have waited a little bit longer? Okay, so uh, what I'm just trying to, uh, to I, I want to separate, tease out the two strands of thought here. One is the intelligence was faulty, and we ought to have known that it was not good enough at the time. An awful lot of people were challenging us, and we did not give, one of the reasons we did not get that resolution was that people decided that it, we were not going to wait, that we were going to go to war no matter what. And that. And then the second strand is that the United Nations has to be behind something before it's legitimate. You, you, you tend to agree with Stephen on that? I, I think that we have paid a real price. Uh, in the end, I mean, I am very happy to see Saddam Hussein gone, and I, I hope deeply for the future right. of Iraqi democracy. However, we paid dearly for not having UN support. We paid in terms of right. not being able to go in through Turkey, which would have made it easier. We have not been able to get the burden sharing that we need. We haven't gotten the international support that we need. It's been an uphill battle, and we've paid with American lives and lots of American dollars. Okay, so the intelligence was lousy. It's a couple of things. And we ought to have worked well, the UN harder. What do you make of that? Well, in October of 2002, the US Senate voted to authorize force to be used against Iraq, and they listed 23 different reasons why that was uh, a good thing, and they included everything from a potential assassination attempt on George Bush, violations of the 1991 armistice, UN violations, genocide, and when Colin Powell went to the UN, he mentioned three or four other criteria for war besides so-called WMD, and as far as Turkey opposing it, well, there, well, were, I, there were I, other... On WMD, on WMD. What, did the Bush administration then make a prudential Absolutely. mistake? Absolutely. They, they should not have rested the case so heavily on WMD. They privileged one of the 23 criteria that the Senate had passed because they thought that had the most resonance. In their okay. defense, people were saying that up until they, point, they did that, they were, if you go back and look at the record, people were saying they were using a shotgun approach to use anything that would stick to go to war. So the question is, it, layman's question, it's further to Victor's point, but the layman's question is, it looked and felt to me as though we were working the UN about as hard as anybody could reasonably have been supposed to work the UN, and that the French and others were simply being obstructionist and had made up their minds. Now, how do you, we had to make a decision and do something. The UN was simply being obstructionist. That's the way it felt to this layman. How do you answer that charge? First of all, we, the United States never made a case uh, to the Security Council that we were uh, for instance, imminently threatened, or we were invoking this out of a, out of self-defense. Right. Um, the argument that the United Kingdom and the United States made was that this was a question of enforcing Security Council resolutions that were already outstanding, and that that is why it got tied in large measure to WMD. Right. Although I think that that was a that was something that that was a real concern, mm -hmm. um, saying that. Uh, Given all the various resolutions that have been passed, and given the fact of non-compliance, something has got to give. Just as Victor says, the Bush administration should not have rested so much of its argument so heavily on WMD. Was this an error to rest so much of the argument before the United Nations on those X number of preceding resolutions, or that was the right way to go? I actually think that, that was a completely appropriate mm -hmm. way to go. Um, the, the question comes down to, given the fact that in March, of 2003, you did not have agreement, right? At the UN. At the UN. Right. Was there reason to go to war in March of 2003? Just prudentially, uh, would it have been worthwhile waiting for instance for uh, Hans Three Blix months. to come back with a new report on, on the status? Six weeks, six months. Three weeks, Three weeks is weeks. what the, right. the British wanted. Um, uh, would that have mattered? Would that have actually turned the t It wasn't just France and Russia, of course, because we, we didn't have a majority of votes uh, on the Security Council. Uh, Let's move on to another key consideration, the broader consequences of preventive force. Preventive force working group here at Stanford, I quote, the decision to utilize preventive force could deter potential target sites, but it could also pa cause potential targets or states to act in anticipation of a preventive attack, close quote. Sir, after we invaded Iraq, North Korea and Iran both began to hustle to develop nuclear weapons. North Korea, it's now widely believed, has succeeded in doing so. Iran, it is widely believed, may succeed very soon. So, by taking preventive action against Saddam Hussein, we took care of Saddam Hussein, the question is, did we create two conceivably even graver threats in the process. No, because you don't create a nuclear weapon in the space of a year. Both the nuclear 
programs in Iran and in Korea had a long pedigree well before Iraq. And if you look at... Would you deny that they hustled? They, they, they stepped up the program once we went into Iraq? Yes, I would also... Would you deny that? That they hustled? Yeah. I don't know what... I don't have access to the information of what degree they started to work harder, but they had been working very hard because they saw there were dividends in getting nuclear weapons as Pakistan proved. And the point is, after we went into Iraq, we did have some positive ripples as well, you're omitting. I don't think Mr. Qaddafi would have come clean. Right. I don't think Mr. Khan would have come clean. Mr. I don't Khan think didn't come clean. <laughs> well, Khan come clean. Arrested. I don't think there would have been he was pressure. arrested. <laughs> yeah, well, there wouldn't have been pressure for his, Pakistan wouldn't have oh, metamorphosized okay. from a neutral or belligerent Mr. Khan is the neutral to a neutral and I don't think you would Well, see. no, they did that after 9/11 where we made it very clear exactly. what was expected but of them. It had nothing to do with an invasion of Iraq. to get H -H -R. H -R. after 9/11 was if we had not gone into Afghanistan or Iraq nobody would have cared. Vic, Afghanistan I want to get is different from Hold Iraq. on, Victor, I want to see how you weigh this. I have the feeling certainly as a, regarding this as a layman that the general feeling is that North Korea and Iraq really put the pedal to the metal on their nuclear programs once we went into Iraq. Let's stipulate that they hustled at least a little bit. So the question is, how do you, thinking through the doctrine of preventive force, weigh this matter that by attacking here, you may help to call into being threats here and here? How do you weigh that? How do you address it? Well, I think it's a little bit irrelevant. That's how I address it. Because I think whether we went into Iraq or not, the question of whether Iran or North Korea were going to go nuclear was going to be based always on the attitude of the United States and China or its the geopolitical situation in that region. Us going into Iraq did not mean that Iran was going to go nuclear or go not nuclear. And I would also weigh another thing, mm -hmm. that there are Syrians outside of Lebanon, there's women voting in Kuwait, there's questions, More there's, positive there's results. talks about right. elections in Egypt and everything from Ethiopia to Uzbekistan. People are talking for the first time in parts of Asia and the Arab world about democracy. Right. That didn't, that didn't well, there happen. There were definitely positive so, parts of Iraq, but the question is, could you have avoided the negative sides? Because how in Iran, for how instance, you, you have a whole b a number of reformers who actually don't want a nuclear weapon. The minute we go into Iraq, that then becomes a nationalist issue. And legitimately, the hardliners can say they're U.S. troops on our border. They, they would never have invaded Iraq if they'd had a nuclear weapon, which goes back to Steve's point. Preventive war is, I think, a necessary doctrine. But it is a very dangerous doctrine. And you gave the best example. If you said preventive war, any state can just engage in preventive war. There is nothing to stop China from going into Taiwan. There is nothing to stop well, there's nothing Arab stopping states. China going to Taiwan tomorrow. The, no, only, no, thing no, no, the only thing that no, stops no, China no. from going into Taiwan is the United States the, military. I'm, look, you need the United States military, but you also need the fact that the uh, the idea that they would do that would set, would cause them to sacrifice all the influence they are working so hard to build I don't think so they would lose anything up. at all. I, I think if tomorrow the United States military said we're, we have no uh, obligations to Taiwan. China would take it over and the world would be trading with it in two days. Fine, we can, you can Same take any, Israel, any example you want. The point is to legitimate preventive war, to let other countries decide we don't like, we're going to go in and take out a threat. Is it, it may be necessary in certain circumstances, but it's like a loaded gun. You don't want it lying around. So, so the reason you, you need, well, you need collective to, uh, authorization is that Iraq, Iran wouldn't be so worried if they didn't think it was just the United States making that decision. Okay. You need how, to, how would you, finally, how to amend the doctrine of preventive force. We have this 2002 national security strategy out there. It says we need to think carefully about the doctrine of preventive force and from time to time possibly use preventive force. If you could amend that document in a sentence or two, if you could amend the thinking of this administration or if you could amend something about the United Nations, what would you do? I, I would say that uh, in the future when uh, a threat is latent but of sufficient danger that we should take the case to the Security Council, and in the future, the, the job is to make the Security Council a much more effective arbiter of when collective force should be used. Victor, what, 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 what amendment would you make? I'd have a little clause that says, and we take this state, we take this step reluctantly because the United Nations is not a democratically constituted body. But you'd take the step. I, I would. 
leave that doctrine intact and just add a qualifier of regret that because we can't act in concert with the United Nations because it's a sum of its See, parts. See, this is moving your way in a big way because what we're having here is a ratification of the slaughter doctrine. And what, would you, what amendment would you make? I, I would say, that, A, we do need it. I agree with this. I would say uh, we should go to the United Nations, but we should uh, expect that the United Nations is going to, in fact, act effectively for how collective security. You, and if not, then... They, just, they, how come the two of you don't kick and fuss and scream about the UN the way Victor does? It's we've got a, half of the members of the United Nations are tin pot dictators, Autocracies, plutocracy. Yeah, I, mean, I just don't see. Do I just don't see do the resistance you, to you or, or no, the urge to reform. Think it needs to be dramatically reformed. Steve okay, has spent the last year trying oh. drama for dramatic reform, but All the right. fact is, as I said. Imagine Iraq, if the UN had been with us, it would have been cheaper, it would have been more effective, we would have had a, a much greater ability to achieve our aims. And when the UN has been with us, we have enjoyed all of that. The first Gulf War, they were completely with us. So what we need is a UN that works and that works in our interest. Because you Henry just got the last word, Victor. I'm terribly sorry. That's okay. You're at no loss for forums in which to, to speak, Victor. Victor Davis Hanson, thank you. Anne Marie Slaughter, and Stephen Stedman, thank you very much. Yep. I'm Peter Robinson. For Uncommon Knowledge, thanks for joining us. We welcome your comments on this week's show. Our email address, comments at uncommonknowledge.tv. For more information about Uncommon Knowledge, please visit our website, www.uncommonknowledge.tv. Funding for this program was provided by the John M. Olin Foundation.